Okay, well, welcome everyone again to Spring Into Action, help manage your diabetes with healthy eating and physical activity. I am going to hand it over to Pris Rogers. Hi, everybody. I'm part of the Vision Aware uh, program, and um, I'm delighted to be able to introduce to you today, Kim Ladd, who is a registered nurse and a, a certified diabetes educator. She has all kinds of certifications in diabetes, and she's done several webinars for us uh, for the Connect Center, as well as uh, rewriting our diabetes guide. And she's done a wonderful job on that. She's also written lots of tips. And some of the tips for today's webinar are in the webinar uh, link that we talked about earlier. So go back and check those out later. And also take a look at the guide to diabetes that Kim has just updated for us. We're adding a few more tidbits to it, but uh, mostly it's all there and intact and available for you all to use with uh, your consumers and so forth. So uh, today, we're uh, Kim is going to be talking about spring into action, um, helping to manage your diabetes with healthy eating and physical activity. And what better time to do it? Spring, right? We're ready to go. So Kim, take it away. Thank you. All right. Thank you both. Hi, everyone. Um, I do want to say something just um, for those that have vision and kind of see me. I am I'm having an untimely issue. I am having Bell's palsy that was just diagnosed a couple of weeks ago. So that is um, facial paralysis. So the left side of my face is paralyzed. So I hope that my diction comes across well because it's kind of affecting my speech a little bit. Um, and of course it's affecting my face and my vision, but I just wanted to let y'all know in case you saw me before and you see my face and you're like, oh my gosh, what's wrong with Kim? Just letting you know. So bear with me, thank you very much. All right, so let me go ahead and share my screen here. All right, yes, good time. And so spring is here, yay. Spring into action. We're gonna talk about healthy eating and being active with diabetes. All right, so this is not a trick question and it should be pretty easy. So the first question, what are the two best things you can do for your health? Just think about it for a second, what you think your answer would be. Survey says, Healthy eating and exercise. I know that's probably not a surprise to anyone because you probably hear that all the time, but it truly is. Um, healthy eating and exercise can not only help manage most chronic conditions that you might have, but they also help prevent chronic conditions or complications from chronic conditions, such as complications from diabetes. So that's what I hope to that's what I hope to make relevant in your life with this webinar today. I hope that you learn some healthy eating, some exercise tips that might help your situation or people that you work with or family or friends. Um, what, what I'm really gonna do is, it's really kind of an overview today. I mean, we could talk about healthy eating for a week and not cover everything. So I'm not gonna delve too deeply into one thing, but I'm going to kind of give you a generalized overview of some simple things that you can do to help with your diabetes management, as well as other chronic diseases. And also anyone that wants to live a healthier life, these are things that can help. But, um, you know, if you truly wanted to get down and dirty into healthy eating, that's kind of when you want to meet one on one with a dietitian because there are some very regimented um, guidelines that you could follow for your particular case that would help bring your blood sugar levels down and keep them down. But you know, it's hard to be that specific with a group of people. So that's why this is kind of a generalized thing. All right, that's my disclaimer, here we go. So think about this. What is your definition of healthy eating? So just kind of think about what you've heard through the years or kind of what your opinion is or what you think healthy eating means to you. So here's kind of my definition. So to me, healthy eating means that most of the time you make good and healthful food choices. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to be perfect or rigid because being strict often discourages you and leads to failure. But it means that you find new or different ways to prepare your meals. 
And if you have health conditions, you need to be choosier. But that does not mean that you can never have the foods that you like most. So actually, there is no one best way of eating that fits everyone, and there is no such thing as a perfect eating style. So I know it has always been, I mean, I've been teaching diabetes for 20 years, and I can remember, you know, 20 years ago, when someone found out they had diabetes, their doctor or whatever, or they would say that their doctor said, you know, you can't eat anything white or they would meet with a dietitian and the dietitian would say, you're on a 1500 kilocalorie diet with exchanges and this is what you can eat. And the dietitian would give you breakfast and they would say, you could have one carb exchange, two protein exchanges and blah, blah, blah. And first of all, most people were like, well, what does an exchange mean? So, and then it would be like, well, what if I don't like that? What do I substitute with it? It was just kind of very regimented and strict. And I mean, and there was a reason behind that because we know that certain foods affect your blood sugar levels. So the whole purpose of that was to not eat a lot of those foods that make your blood sugar levels go up. But kind of what happened is it became very complicated to follow a diabetes diet. So this is my personal opinion, but I feel like it was so complicated that it caused frustration and people didn't do it. And through the years, you know, diabetes cases have skyrocketed. And I think one of the reasons is because healthy eating with diabetes was complicated and it's, it's kind of discouraging. So people didn't do it and their diabetes was not well controlled and then they end up having complications. So luckily kind of the scientific community has kind of paid attention to that. And what we're gonna talk about today is kind of what the consensus is on healthy eating for diabetes. Basically, no food is off limits, but there are guidelines that you need to follow. And that's what we're gonna talk about. All right. So healthy eating is at the core of diabetes self-management. You know, really you are the only one who can manage your blood sugar levels. People can tell you what to do. You know, you can read everything you want about it, but what you put into action in your life is what's gonna help you manage your blood sugar levels. So the power is within you to make positive changes. But just know that even small changes in your eating habits can actually make an important difference in your blood sugar levels and how you feel. I want you to know that you do not have to go hungry. You do not need to eat special diabetic in quotation foods, and you can still eat foods that you like. But like I said, we're gonna talk about what that means. Healthy eating for diabetes is actually healthy eating for everyone. You know, technically when you have diabetes, there's nothing you can't eat, but the key to controlling your blood sugar levels is knowing how the foods and the amount of foods you eat affect your blood sugar level. So anyone, whether they have diabetes or not, should follow these healthy eating guidelines that we're gonna talk about to live a healthier life. Because many of the foods that affect your blood sugar levels are foods that you probably shouldn't eat a whole lot of anyway. So everyone needs a balance of protein, fat, and carbohydrates to stay healthy. But eating right is just extra important for people with diabetes because like I said, there are certain foods that raise your blood sugar levels or increase your chance for um, diabetes complications. All right. So here's the little formula that I use. So to help you control and prevent health problems, you want balance and moderation. That is the formula for healthy eating. So balance means you want a variety of different foods. You know, we all kind of heard growing up about the, um, you know, the food triangle, about how you're supposed to have a certain amount of fats and grains and dairy and protein. Kind of you want to eat everything from the food triangle. Well, they actually don't even use the food triangle anymore. Um, they use the healthy plate, which we're going to talk about. 
later. So I don't want to spoil that. But you want to get a variety of food, you know, from all the food groups, fruits and vegetables, carbohydrates, protein, dairy. So that's the main thing. And you want moderation. And moderation is a fancy word for portion control. So you don't want to eat too much and you want to eat a bunch of different things. But specifically for diabetes, some things that help you control your blood sugar level or eating regular meals, including breakfast. I work with a lot of people with diabetes and a lot of people don't eat breakfast. And, you know, grandma was right. Breakfast actually is the most important meal of the day. You know, breakfast actually means to break the fast. So if you think about it, unless you sleepwalk, and go to the refrigerator and eat while you're sleepwalking, you are not eating while you're sleeping. So it's at least an eight hour span where your body is not getting any energy. And that's all that food is. It's energy for our body. So in order to help keep your energy level normalized and to help normalize your blood sugar level, you want your blood sugar level to be like a wave on the ocean. Everybody's blood sugar level, you know, is going to go up when they eat and then it's going to start to come back down like a wave and then go up and down throughout the day. That is how you want your energy level and your blood sugar level to be. So the way to do that is to eat regularly. When you don't eat breakfast, you know, your blood sugar level is going to be low. And then when you eat, it's going to spike up. And then after you're done, it's going to spike back down. That's what you want to prevent. Those spikes in your blood sugar are things that make you feel bad and, you know, make you have to, oh, my blood sugar's high. So I need to give myself some insulin to get it back down. So then you're spiking back down and then, oh no, it's too low. So I got to eat food to get it back up. If you eat regularly, um, you are going to help stabilize that blood sugar level. So I hope that makes sense. So eat regular meals, including breakfast. You know, it's a good kind of rule of thumb to eat breakfast within like an hour of rising, you know, just so you can get that energy and get your blood sugar going, stabilized to start your day. You also want to eat at about the same time every day. This also helps regulate your blood sugar and your energy levels. Your body likes balance and it likes a schedule. So if you tend to keep a schedule seven days a week, you tend to feel better. I mean, I pick on myself. I have diabetes and, um, you know, no one's perfect. So I'm the first to admit that I don't do everything perfect, even though I teach it. Um, but I always, you know, I love sleep. I love, love sleep. So, you know, Monday through Friday, I'm going to work. So I'm getting up early, you know, and I'm going to work and I pretty much keep a schedule. You know, I eat breakfast at the same time. I have my lunch break, I eat lunch at the same time, and then I have dinner at the same time, and then I'm also going to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time, and I feel pretty good during the week, but here comes Saturday, the one day I just want to sleep in, so what do I do? I sleep in, and then what do I do? I don't eat breakfast at the same time, or I only eat two meals a day because I slept through breakfast. I always feel horrible on the weekends. And you would think that would be enough to make me set my alarm and just get up on Saturday, but stubborn Kim just can't seem to get it together because she'd rather have sleep. So, I mean, if you've ever noticed that in yourself that you feel different when you don't have a set schedule than when you do, that might be part of the reason why. So it really is important to keep a schedule seven days a week. Um, another thing you want to do to help prevent um, diabetes and to help control diabetes is pay attention to your portion size. Um, it, it takes 20 minutes for your brain to register that you are full. So mama always, always said to eat slow as well. So, I mean, you know, these old wives tale that we've been hearing throughout the years, there's a lot of truth behind them. So eat slow. Um, that way you tend to eat less. And then that can help cut down on your portion size. You also want to do something that I want, that I kind of call conscious eating. This means consciously making a decision about what you're going to eat before you eat it. Think about what you're going to eat. Sometimes if you take a minute to think about it, you know, you can kind of make a better choice. Now, that's not going to work all the time, 
But educating yourself on what good food choices are and making the best decision possible, conscious eating can help you eat more healthy. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. All right. So I'm just going to give you just a, a, a very brief overview on the breakdown of food. OK, just so it helps make things make sense. So there are three main macronutrients in food. Now, macronutrients are nutrients that our body needs in large amounts to function properly. So foods also contain micronutrients and micronutrients are things like vitamins and minerals. They are essential for many of our body's functions, but we need a much smaller amount of them, thus the word micro, and they don't usually provide any calories. So macronutrients we need in large amounts and they have calories to them. And remember calorie is energy and energy is food. And that's why we eat to get energy for our body to properly function. All right, so the three main macronutrients are protein, fat, and carbohydrates. Now, the good thing about protein and fat, when you eat foods with protein and fat, they do not raise your blood sugar levels. When you eat foods containing carbohydrates, they do raise your blood sugar level because they are broken down into sugar. So we'll get into that a little bit in a little bit. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about protein. So protein has a lot of benefits for people with diabetes. Like I said, protein does not raise your blood sugar level. It has a high satiety that level, meaning it makes you feel full for longer. They also, protein is low calorie. One gram of protein has four calories. When you pair a protein food with a carbohydrate, it actually helps slow the digestion of the carbohydrate. And that is good because carbohydrates are also classified according to how quickly they raise your blood sugar level. And sugary carbohydrates tend to raise your blood sugar levels faster than a starchy carbohydrate. So whether you eat a simple carb or a starchy carb, if you pair it with a protein, that protein helps slow the absorption down because the body has more than just a carb to digest. So it digests slowly and it more slowly releases the sugar into your bloodstream. So some examples, this is one trick you can use if you're craving some carbohydrate, pair it with a protein. So some examples are like pears and cheese, apples and peanut butter, you know, whole grain crackers and peanut butter, cottage cheese and carrots, raisins and nuts, strawberries and yogurt or a protein bar. So those are all kind of good snacks if you have diabetes because they're not going to raise your blood sugar levels as high. All right, so fats. You know, it is essential. I know you, we always hear all this low fat, don't eat fats. Our body actually needs some fats to properly function. However, this is one of those where you don't want to get, you don't want to eat too many fats because then it increases your chance for coronary artery disease. And remember, I've said in one of my other webinars that the number one complication of diabetes is cardiovascular disease, heart attacks. Um, so you really want to pay attention to your fat intake as well as your carbohydrate intake when you have diabetes. However, it's okay to eat some. And also not all fat is bad for us. Because like I said, our body needs some fat for survival and to work properly, but you do have to be aware of the good versus the bad fat. So all fats are made up of saturated and unsaturated fatty acids. Fats are called saturated, which is the bad fat, or unsaturated, which is the good fat depending on how much of each type of fatty acid they contain. All right, so I said the good fat is called unsaturated fat. There are two types. There's monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fat. These are actually the fats that you want to eat because they keep our cells healthy. They actually help reduce our cholesterol levels. They are found in nuts, seeds, 
avocados, olives. Those are the main sources of good fat. So you might hear like avocado is a high fat food, but what you need to realize is it's high in good fat, the unsaturated fat. So avocado is a great thing to eat for your overall health. The same with nuts and seeds. They are high in unsaturated fat and they're full of vitamins and minerals. So they're very healthy. Um, also, you know, cooking oils are also good fat. Good fat are, are liquid at room temperature. So that includes oils. So things like soybean oil, safflower oil, peanut oil, sunflower oil, canola oil, and olive oil. On a scale, olive oil is considered the healthiest oil. And then canola, and then the rest are kind of about the same. So it's much, much better to cook or, you know, whatever you're going to do, however you're going to cook to use oil instead of lard, shortening, butter, things like that. You want things that are liquid at room temperature to cook in, not solid at room temperature. All right, so the bad fats are also known as saturated fats. The reason they're so bad is because they actually raise your total blood cholesterol levels and low density lipoprotein cholesterol levels. So, you know, cholesterol is either LDL, low density lipoprotein, low density lipoprotein, or HDL, high density lipoprotein. HDL is healthy cholesterol. I remember that by the H. H, HDL, H healthy. That's the healthy cholesterol. L is low density. That's the bad cholesterol that clogs, that clogs your arteries and predisposes you to coronary artery disease. So bad fat raises that bad cholesterol level. Bad fats mostly come from animal foods. So things like beef, sausage, bacon, um, lunch meat, deli meat, poultry skin, whole milk, cream cheese, sour cream. Anything that's usually solid at room temperature. So things that I mentioned before, shortening, butter, lard, bacon grease, beef fat, chicken fat, stick margarines. So if it's solid at room temperature, it has bad fat and you don't want to use it, but sparingly. There are some oils, however, that are considered bad fat. So palm kernel oil, coconut oil, and cocoa butter, butter are also considered bad fats because they are high in saturated fats. Now, I remember a few years ago, coconut oil was all the rage and everyone was like, coconut oil is the healthiest thing. Use it, use it, use it. But please don't buy into that. They were completely wrong because coconut oil actually has the highest percentage of saturated fat of any oil. And it is solid at room temperature. That's how you know it's a bad fat, solid at room temperature. Um, coconut oil is great for your skin. Rub it on your skin or whatever, but I would not cook with it. All right. There's also another type of fat called trans fat. So this is a bad fat as well. You will see it listed on nutrition labels as partially hydrogenated or hydrogenated oils. Now, trans fat actually occurs naturally in some foods in small amounts, but mostly trans fats are made um, from oils through a food processing method called partial hydrogenation. So they actually take something that's a healthy fat, like vegetable oil, and they turn it into an unhealthy fat. Why do they do this? Well, <laughs> they do this mostly to help preserve foods. So that's usually why it's done. So humans took something healthy, made it unhealthy. So trans fat increases unhealthy LDL cholesterol and it actually lowers your healthy cholesterol, which this of course increases your risk of cardiovascular disease. Trans fats actually have the most harmful effects on our blood cholesterol levels and increase our risk of heart attack more than any other type of fat. So what, where is trans fat found? So it is found in many processed foods. So things like 
vegetable shortening, margarine, pastries, cakes, cookies, you know, the icing that comes in a can, most microwave popcorn brands. So that's why I say, you know, popcorn is actually a pretty healthy snack. But when it's microwave popcorn, which of course is the easiest way to make it, I'm not saying I haven't eaten it either, but most microwave popcorns have trans fat in them. So you're kind of, you know, you're, you're outweighing the healthy with the unhealthy with the trans fat. Trans fats also found in non-dairy coffee creamers, fried fast foods, and many canned boxed foods. So basically anything in the grocery store that comes you know, in the middle aisles. I tell everybody when you shop, just shop the perimeter of the store. That's where all the fresh food is. That's where all the fruits and vegetables, the meat, you know, the frozen vegetables, all of that. The healthiest stuff is the perimeter of the store. Everything that's kind of in the aisles is boxed or packaged, and it probably has trans fat in it. If it doesn't have trans fat, it's going to have a lot of sodium because sodium and trans fat are the two preservatives that are mostly used to keep food from spoiling. All right, but there is good news about trans fat. The FDA actually banned trans fat starting in June 18th of 2018. However, unfortunately, a bunch of the groups lobbied the FDA saying, oh, we can't get it done by then, or we can't get it done by then for one reason or another. So they just kind of keep delaying the ban. But most food manufacturers have reduced or gotten rid of the trans fat in their packaging, but there are many that still have it. And actually, if it has 0.5 grams of trans fat per serving, it can still be labeled as having no grams of trans fat. So it's a little bit tricky with that. So you kind of have to do it by the types of food that you eat. So remember, fresh is best. So anything fresh is not going to have trans fat in it. It's going to be the packaged food. All right. So why is eating fat not healthy? Well, like I said, cardiac disease is the number one complication of diabetes and high cholesterol and fat levels contribute to cardiac disease. So if you already have diabetes, you're more prone to have cardiac disease. And if you eat a lot of fat, then you're more prone to have cardiac disease. So that gives you two risk factors for cardiac disease. You can't really control the fact that you have diabetes, but you can control the fact of how much fat that you eat. So that's why eating healthy is important because it's something that you can control. All right, so what is cholesterol? Cholesterol is actually a waxy fat-like substance that's found in all cells of our body. If you have too much cholesterol in your blood, it can combine with other substances in the blood to form plaque. Plaque is what sticks to the walls of your arteries and builds up. This is often known as atherosclerosis. This is what leads to coronary artery disease because it builds up and it makes the arteries become more narrow or blocked. So, you know, if you have a hose and you kink it, the water is not going to flow through anymore. So that's kind of what happens with your arteries in your body. If you have enough plaque built up, that either that opening, the circumference has gotten tiny, tiny, small, or either completely kinked, blocked off, blood is not going to be able to flow through that artery. You know, and depending on which artery is blocked, depends on what damage you're going to have. You know, if it's a main artery to your heart, it could be a heart attack. If it's your carotid arteries, it could be a stroke. So, you know, you don't have any control over where that fat is going to attach to your arteries. So the best prevention is to help prevent extra fat from circulating through your blood. So one way to know if how you're eating is healthy is to get your cholesterol levels checked. So overall, you want your total cholesterol level to be less than 200. If it is 240 or more, you are considered to have high cholesterol. However, there are different components to the cholesterol level. So a lot of times the doctor will look at the components more than they look at the total cholesterol goal. So 
there's the LDL level and there's the HDL level. And remember that I said the LDL is the unhealthy cholesterol and the HDL is the healthy cholesterol. So you want your LDL level to be low. You want LDL to be less than 100. You want your HDL level to be high. So you want that 60 or higher. So the higher the HDL level is, the healthier you will be. All right. Also, um, triglycerides are another common type of fat in our body. And they come from foods, especially butter, oils, and other fats that you eat. Triglycerides also come from extra calories. Extra calories are calories that you eat, but that your body does not need right away. Your body changes these extra calories into triglycerides and stores them in fat cells. So when your body needs energy, it then releases the triglycerides. However, that's, you know, that's where you got to find the balance of not eating too many calories so you don't make too much triglyceride that your body can't use when it needs it, and then eating just the right amount so that your triglyceride level doesn't go high. Having a high level of triglycerides also raises your risk of heart disease, such as coronary artery disease. Um, your triglyceride range is also a component that will show up when your cholesterol is checked, and it should be less than 150. So borderline high triglyceride range is 150 to 199. Your triglyceride level is considered high if it's 200 to 499, and it's considered very high if it's 500 or above. All right, so what if you have high triglyceride levels, high fat levels, or you're eating foods that I talked about that are high fat? So how can you do better? How can you lower these levels? One thing is to lose weight. Another is to eat a healthier diet. Another is to get more exercise. Another is to reduce alcohol intake. The more alcohol you drink, the higher your bad cholesterol and triglyceride levels are. Another way is if you've tried everything else and nothing is lowering those levels, you might have to take a cholesterol lowering medication. You know, these are statins, um, you know, um, high dose niacin and vitamin D6 sometimes works for some people or a drug called Wellcall is another um, medication that can help lower cholesterol. But of course, you don't wanna start any of those without having the conversation with your doctor. First, usually if someone gets a high cholesterol level, it's not, it's got, you know, maybe if it's in the two to 300 range, you know, the doctor might let you try to change your diet first. But, you know, if it's 300 or above, they usually want you to immediately start on a, a medication to help, you know, like a torvastatin or something to help lower your cholesterol level. Basically, any medication that has S-T-A-T-I-N in the name is a cholesterol medication. But that's a conversation, like I said, to have with your doctor. But here are some tips to help lower fat or cholesterol levels in the foods that you eat. Now, you know, these are things that are easy changes to make. Please don't feel like you need to write all these down. You know, you can always watch this um, webinar later or they're also in the resource tips for this webinar. Okay, so one is to keep cooked portions of cooked meat, fish and poultry to two to three ounces. Now, you know, that is not a large amount of food but that actually is what a serving size of meat is. Two to three ounces cooked. That's about the size of a deck of cards or the palm of your hand. Okay. Do not eat the skin on poultry. So, you know, whenever you eat chicken, you want to take that skin off and trim the fat off as much as you can. Eat more deep water fish, such as salmon, tuna, and mackerel. Choose leaner cuts of beef, such as round sirloin or frank, flank, sorry, flank for beef, or choose white meat, pork, or chicken. Those tend to have less fat in them. Like I said, trim off all the fat from the meat before cooking. Use low fat or fat-free milk and dairy products. Instead of frying your food, bake, broil, steam, or grill. I know the air fryers are a big thing now. That's a healthier alternative to frying food. In cooking and baking, use a healthy oil 
such as olive or canola oil, and soft tub margarine instead of shortening, unhealthy oils, lard, butter, or stick margarine. So if you have to use kind of a butter thing, it's better to use the soft tub margarine instead of butter. Um, and if you need to use an oil, use olive or, can or canola, I mean, or vegetable oil. Any of the oils are better. But like I said, olive is the healthiest. The one thing to know, if you do fry something and you use olive oil, olive oil has a lower burn rate. So um, you really have to be careful because it will burn or catch on fire at a lower temperature than like canola or vegetable oil will. All right, another tip to lower fat, use nonstick cooking spray instead of butter, shortening, lard, or grease. You know, that's the spray stuff that comes in the can instead of throwing oil or butter in the pan. Skim the fat from soups and stews before cooking and after refrigeration. So with any kind of soup or stew, you know, as it cools, it gets that layer of fat on top of it. So you wait till it cools and then you just take a spoon and you skim off that fat and you throw it away. So that's one easy way to get rid of the fat in your soup. Use less butter, margarine, gravies, meat or cream-based sauces and spreads and creamy salad dressing. So unfortunately, you like, you know, I'm not a huge salad lover, but when I eat a salad, you know, I like my ranch dressing and that's like the, <laughs> the least healthy dressing. The best is like oil and vinaigrette or Italian, something that doesn't have the cream base to it. Nuts are a great snack. So snack on nuts. Nuts are full of healthy B vitamins and um, healthy fat. And like I said, add avocado to sandwich and salads because avocado is also a great um, snack. All right, so carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are our body's main source of energy. It is fuel for your brain, central nervous system and red blood cells. Our digestive system changes carbohydrates into glucose, which is also known as sugar and uses this sugar for energy for our cells, tissues, and organs. So you see carbohydrates are very important. So it's never a good idea to eat no carbohydrates. I'm gonna talk a little bit about diets at the end to help explain that a little bit more. With carbohydrates, um, any sugar um, from the food that we eat is stored in our liver and our muscles for when it's needed at a later time. So because carbohydrates are changed into sugar, carbohydrates is the macronutrient that largely determines our blood sugar level. All right, sorry, I thought I saw something in the chat. I just wanted to check. So carbs are either sugar or starches. They are found mostly in plant-based foods. Milk and yogurt are about the only animal foods with more than just a small amount of carbohydrates. And like I said a little earlier, foods with carbohydrates are categorized as either high in sugar or high in starch. Foods that are high in sugar break down faster, get into your bloodstream faster, give you energy faster, and raise your blood sugar level faster than foods that are high in starch. So sugary carbohydrates, these are the ones that get in faster, raise your blood sugar faster. Sugary carbohydrates are the ones that you have permission to eat if you have hypoglycemia. So if you're having a low blood sugar episode, you are told to eat 15 grams of a sugary carbohydrate. That is when these are the most useful for people with diabetes. Not saying you can't eat them at other times, but you just have to be smart about it. So sugary carbohydrates are found in fruit juice, milk, yogurt, honey, jellies, syrups, and sugar sweetened drinks. So basically anything that has added sugar in it, sugary carbohydrate. They are also found naturally in fruits, vegetables, milk, and milk products. Foods such as cakes and cookies have added sugars and table sugar is considered an added sugar. So remember all of these sugars are converted in your body to glucose, which is sugar in your body. Starchy carbohydrates are also broken down into sugar. They are found in certain vegetables, such as potatoes, corn, green peas. Oh, I have potatoes twice. It must mean that because potatoes 
are high in sugar. Winter squash, dried beans and peas, and lentils. Starchy carbohydrates are also found in breads, cereals, and grains. And remember, a grain is any food made from wheat, rice, oats, cornmeal, barley, or another cereal grain. So these are things like any bread, pasta, oatmeal, breakfast cereals, tortillas, grits. However, the amount of carbohydrates in whole grains, such as brown rice and whole wheat bread, is similar to that in refined grains, like white bread and white rice, but the difference is that the refined grains are less healthy because during refinement, nutrients, phytochemicals, and fiber have been lost. So that's kind of why in the old days, doctors or dietitians might have told you, don't eat anything white, because that would be things like, you know, white flour, um, white bread, white rice, white pasta, because they, not only are they a carbohydrate, but they also have all, most of the fiber taken out of them. So they are less healthy options. If you're going to eat grains, bread, pasta, you want it to be whole grains, you know, whole wheat, whole grain, brown rice, things like that, because they have not lost the fiber. Okay, speaking of fiber, I always say fiber is your friend. And it truly is. Fiber is also known as roughage or bulk. It is actually considered a carbohydrate, but it includes the parts of plant foods that your body can't digest or absorb. So unlike other food components like fat, protein, and carbohydrates, which your body breaks down and absorbs, fiber is not digested by your body. Instead, it passes relatively intact through your stomach, small intestine, and colon, and out of your body. However, while it's sitting in your intestines, it is sopping up excess cholesterol. It's getting rid of it, and it, it's getting rid of it before it can clog your arteries. It scrubs and promotes the elimination of toxins from your GI tract, and it also promotes healthy gut bacteria. A high fiber diet may also help reduce the risk of obesity, colon cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. Fiber also has a high satiety level, remember? And I said that means it makes you feel fuller, longer, so you tend to eat less. So fiber is a wonderful thing. Um, fiber is actually listed on nutrition labels under the carbohydrates. It'll say total carbohydrates, and then it'll usually say um, added sugars, sugar, fiber. However, if you are using information on a nutrition label to calculate or count your carbohydrates, which I'll talk a little bit about later, you can actually subtract the number of fiber from the total carbohydrate number. So say a slice of bread, total, carbo total carbohydrates is 20 grams, fiber, five grams. So that slice of bread actually has 15 grams of carbs, not 20. So that actually is a good thing. So only plant foods contain fiber. And the foods with the highest amounts of fiber include lentils, black beans, peas, raspberries, bran flakes, whole wheat pasta, peanuts, and pears. It is found naturally in whole and minimum, minimally processed plant foods that have skins, seeds, and strings, such as whole grains, oat bran, oatmeal, brown rice, whole wheat breads, dried beans, peas, lentils, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. Um, so, you know, you hear some of the same foods on some of the same lists, like, you know, fruits have natural sugar in them, so they're a carbohydrate, but they're also high fiber. So fruit is a good choice because it has fiber in it. The best fruit that has the lowest amount of carbs and the highest amount of fiber are berries. So strawberries, blueberries, raspberry, any berry is an excellent choice for someone that has diabetes. I do want to warn you that when you add fiber to your diet, you want to do it gradually over a period of few weeks and make sure you drink plenty of water because you don't want to get constipated. You want to make sure you help process that fiber and prevent constipation by drinking plenty of water. And we know that water is the healthiest drink. So that's actually a two- you know, that's a bonus. So carbs, 
Tips for choosing healthy carbs. Because remember, I said carbohydrates is the nutrient that mostly determines your blood sugar level. Just checking my time to make sure I'm staying with it. All right. So fill at least half your plate with a variety of vegetables and whole fruits. Eat whole grains, such as brown rice, whole grain breads and rolls, whole grain pasta and tortillas. Choose foods with whole wheat or whole grain listed first on the ingredient list. Choose whole fruit rather than fruit juice because it helps fill you up and you don't get all that extra sugar. Choose high fiber breakfast cereals such as shredded wheat, grape nuts, or raisin, raisin bran. Eat high fiber crackers such as whole rye or multigrain crackers and whole grain flatbread. Snack on whole fruit or non-fat yogurt rather than sweets, pastries, or ice cream. So, like I said, it's hard to remember all that, but it's on the list with the resources for this webinar. I also don't want to neglect beverages. You know, food is often a focus when it comes to diabetes, but don't forget that the beverages you drink can also have an effect on your weight and your blood glucose levels. It's very important to stay hydrated and water is simply your best choice when it comes to hydration. You want to avoid sugary drinks like regular soda, fruit punch, fruit drinks, energy drinks, sports drinks, sweet tea, and other sugary drinks because they will raise your blood sugar levels and they also provide several hundred calories in just one serving. I've had a lot of clients that were able to reduce their medications for diabetes simply because they stopped drinking regular soda. You know, there were people that were drinking that regular soda was like their, their drink of choice. And when they were able to slowly come off of that, they were able to lower their diabetes medication. So that's how important the beverages you drink are. So remember, portion control is very important. It's very easy to eat more food than you need or even hungry for without realizing it. So remember what I said, eat slow because it takes 20 minutes for your body to realize that you're full. You also want to know what a serving size is, and that will help you calculate your calories and the macronutrient amounts and help you not overeat. So remember, for example, I said a serving of protein such as chicken or fish is about the size of a deck of cards or the palm of your hand. You can also learn serving sizes by reading nutrition labels. All nutrition labels are set up for serving size, not for the size of the package. And it will tell you, you know, half a cup of cereal is a serving size. So, you know, if you really want to be a stickler for the portion size, you can start teaching yourself portion control by using the information on the food labels. There is another way you can do it. It's called the food plate method. This is kind of the latest way um, for the USDA to teach nutrition. So, and it's also an easy way to learn portion size. Basically what you're doing is you take a regular size plate. So like a nine inch diameter plate, you divide it in half. You know, you can do this mentally or there are actually plates that you can buy that are already divided. Um, so divide it in half. Half of your plate should be full of non-starchy vegetables and fruit. The other half, you divide that into fourths. One fourth of your plate should be lean protein and the other fourth can be a starch. So that's just kind of an easy way to figure out variety and portion size and keep you in check. So remember half of the plate, non-starchy vegetables and fruit, a quarter of the plate, lean protein, and a quarter of the plate can be your starch. So carb counting is something I'm just going to mention. You know, if you really want to learn about carb counting, that's when you really need to meet with a dietitian because there's more, it's more involved than what I'm going to, what overview I'm going to give you. But I just want to mention it in case it's something that piques your interest or you want to learn more about it. So since carbohydrates are the nutrient that affects your blood sugar levels the most, carbohydrate counting or just simply carb counting is a helpful tool you can use. Carb counting involves being knowledgeable of the carbohydrate content in food, the portion size of food, and then actually being willing to keep track of or count your carbs. It's a little overwhelming at first, but it actually becomes much easier with practice, mostly because most of us tend to eat the same kinds of food. So it takes a little bit more homework up front to kind of research and find out how many carbs is in a serving of a certain food. But, you know, then you tend to memorize it. I mean, I tend to do carb counting just to keep myself you know, in line and like the foods that I eat, I tend to have memorized, um, you know, like a slice of bread is considered 15 grams of carbs. So if I have a sandwich, it's 30 grams. So, um, you know, and then depending on what you put on the sandwich, you know, cheese might have one gram, um, things like that. So it does get easier if you do it. So if this is something you want to do, you know, commit yourself to it, do your homework and it will become much easier as you go. So there's kind of two methods of counting carbs. 
One is counting carbohydrate servings, and the other one is counting carbohydrate grams. So first I'm gonna mention counting carbohydrate servings. So one serving of a starch, fruit, or dairy product counts as one carb or 15 grams of carbohydrates. So you need to know what a serving size is, and one serving size is 15 grams. So for example, one slice of bread is one starch serving. So that's 15 grams of carbs. One apple is one fruit serving. So that's 15 grams of carbs. One cup of milk is one dairy serving. So that's about 15 grams of carbs. A cup of milk actually has 12 grams of carbs, but they just round things to 15 grams with the counting carbohydrate serving method. So you would have to look up the food you want, find out what a serving size is, and then do the math with um, 15 grams of carbs. The more accurate method, because you actually count the actual carbohydrate amount in grams is counting carbohydrate grams. And I tend to find this one easier as well. So if you're gonna count carbohydrate grams, the formula kind of is at each meal, you wanna eat no more than 45 to 60 grams of carbohydrates minus the fiber. Cause remember I said you can reduce the amount of carbs by subtracting the fiber. And then you wanna keep each snack at 25 grams or less. So basically with counting carbohydrate grams, you're again gonna use um, the nutrition label or some resources that I'll show you to find out how many grams of carbohydrate is in what you're eating. So like I said, um, one cup of milk actually has 12 grams of carbohydrates in it. So if I drink one cup of milk at my breakfast, I'm gonna write down 12 or keep track of 12. So then I know everything else that I have, egg is zero grams, so I wouldn't even count that. Cheese usually is like two grams, so 12 plus two is 14. I'm gonna have a piece of toast and that's 15 grams. Oh my goodness, now the math is getting hard. <laughs> um, so 14 and 15, that's 29. So I'm at 29 grams with that. What if I want some jelly? That might be 10 grams. So I'm at 39 grams. Does that make sense? So what you're gonna do is everything that you're gonna consume at that meal, you're gonna figure out the carbohydrate grams and add it together. And you don't want it to add, you don't want it to add up to be more than 60 grams of carbohydrates. If you eat a snack, you want your snack to be at 25 grams or less. This used to be the way, a couple of years ago, this used to be the way they taught um, healthy eating. They don't really teach this anymore, but I like it as kind of a guideline to help teach you what foods are better to eat when you have diabetes. So like I said, if you wanna learn carb counting, um, I mean, you can read about it, but meeting with a dietitian is the best thing. So here are some tools that you can use, you know, um, with vision impairment. You know, the good thing is we have Alexa and Siri and Google. You can just ask them, you can go, hey Alexa, how many grams of carbohydrates is in one cup of milk? And Alexa will tell you. So, you know, you don't even have to be able to read a book or anything. You can just ask your Siri or your Alexa and figure out what it is. So that makes it real easy. There are some apps like MyFitnessPal that um, you can scan food labels and it will calculate all the nutrients for you. You could also use things like Be My Eyes or Seeing AI, you know, apps on your phone. And you can have the person with Be My Eyes, you know, you could have the person that answers the phone to read the nutrition label to you. Seeing AI, it will read a lot of the nutrition labels. Um, so you can use that. DigitEyes is an app that you pay for. It's $9.99 and it's for the iPhone. And um, that's one that can read food labels and scan codes. There's also a website, directionsforme.org. This is a um, accessible website that you can put in any food and it will tell you the nutrition facts and give you recipes for any food that you put in. You know, it works well with screen readers and JAWS. So that's an accessible site that you can use to do your homework about nutrition and foods, or, you know, just use whatever low vision devices you have to magnify or light up the food labels, CCTVs, whatever you have to help read it. Because the print is small anyway, even people with vision have a hard time reading those nutrition labels because they have to fit so much on such a small package. But like I said, these resources are listed on the blog and in the resource page. All right, I want to briefly mention the glycemic index because this also used to be the fad of counting carbs and eating with um, 
diabetes. So you might hear about it. Um, so basically, when you have diabetes, you know, you need to monitor your carbohydrate intake, but different carbohydrate containing foods affect blood sugar differently. And these effects can be quantified by measures known as the glycemic index and the glycemic load. The glycemic index or GI index is a value assigned to foods based on how slowly or how quickly these foods cause an increase in your blood glucose levels. So the GI assigns a numeric score to a food based on how drastically or quickly it makes your blood sugar rise. Foods are ranked on a scale of zero to 100 with pure sugar given a value of 100. So that's the highest and the quickest that your blood sugar is gonna go up 100 is. So the lower a, flu, the lower a food's glycemic index, the slower the blood sugar rises after eating the food. So in general, the more processed a food is, the higher its glycemic index, and the more fiber or fat in a food, the lower its glycemic index. So foods low in the glycemic index tend to release glucose slowly and steadily, so they are better choices. The slow and steady release of glucose helps maintain good glucose control. Foods high on the glycemic index release glucose rapidly. The glycemic load is also a factor in this. Um, so to understand a food's complete effect on your blood sugar, you need to know both how quickly it makes glucose enter the bloodstream, which is the, G, the GI index, and how much glucose for serving it can deliver. So a separate measure called the glycemic load does both. So that it actually gives you a more accurate picture of a food's real life impact on your blood sugar. So I have a website that you can click on and it lists a whole bunch of foods and their glycemic load. So if that's something that you really wanna research, I have you a starting place. Um, and that's something that you, you know, work on yourself or meet with a dietitian about if that's how you wanna help eating healthier. So glycemic index versus carb counting. So many nutrition experts believe that people with diabetes should pay attention to both the glycemic index and the glycemic load to avoid sudden spikes in the blood sugar. However, the American Diabetes Association says that the total amount of carbohydrate in a food rather than its glycemic index or load is actually a stronger predictor of what will happen to blood sugar. And some dietitians also feel that focusing on the glycemic index and load adds an unneeded layer of complexity to choosing what you eat. So, I mean, I find the GI index kind of complicated. So personally, I've chosen not to do that. I find counting carbs an easier and more effective way. Um, and really, if you are on insulin, carb counting is probably your better choice because many people um, figure out their insulin dose by the amount of carbs that they ingest. So, but I just wanted to throw the GI index out there because it still comes up in conversations with people. All right. So here's some diabetes healthy eating tips. Develop an eating plan. Once you understand which foods are healthier and how much you should eat, work on developing a meal plan that works for you. So remember I said that kind of takes homework. So in the beginning, do some homework. Look up foods that you normally eat. Find out if they're a healthy choice or not. Or is there a healthier way of making it that you can still get the food that you want that will be healthier for you? So do your homework. Prevent high or low blood sugar. Blood sugar that is either too high or too low causes real problems and makes you feel sick. So remember, when you start eating correctly, it helps prevent that. You will feel better if you are able to adopt a healthier eating plan. You also want to set goals for healthy eating. Setting goals helps you change your eating habits, keeps you accountable and prevents you from getting overwhelmed. You know, don't change everything overnight. Pick one change that you can make and do your best. Pick a weekly goal. Like, you know, the people that I said were able to come off of some of their medicine because they stopped drinking regular soda. So let's just pretend you drink four Coca-Colas a day. So your goal could be, I'm only going to drink three Coca-Colas a day over the next week. And then you do it, you accomplish it, and then you're going to go, I'm only going to drink two Coca-Colas a day over the next week. And before you know it, you've weaned yourself off a of Coke. And then you pick another goal. So, you know, 
smaller, manageable goals will help you make healthy changes. Do not overwhelm yourself. If you learn anything from this, remember that. Do not overwhelm yourself. You've developed your eating habits over your whole life. So it is unrealistic to think that you're going to change to a healthy eating pattern overnight. You have to be patient with yourself. So when making a goal, be as specific as possible. You want to make it measurable, attainable, and have an end date. So that's why I say make it for a week. You know, you don't have to start on Monday. You can start whatever day you want. So tomorrow is what, Thursday. So you could say, by next Thursday, I am going to only drink three Coca-Colas a day. And then by next Thursday, you can look back and think, did I achieve it every day? How many days did I achieve it? And you know what? If you were only able to achieve it three out of seven days, that's okay. Make it your, change your goal to make it easier to attain. And maybe your goal should be, I'm only going to drink four Coca-Colas four days a week. You know, I hope that makes sense. You want to be nice to yourself with your goals so that you can achieve them. Because you know what? When you achieve something, it makes you feel so good that you achieved it. And it spurs you on to make more positive changes. So these are just some healthy eating goals that you can use for yourself if they help you. Um, or, you know, come up with your own. Um, focus on whole fruits more than drinking 100% juice. Snack on fresh, frozen, canned, or dried fruits instead of cookies, brownies, or other sugar-sweetened treats. Offer whole food, fruits without saturated fat, sodium, or added sugars as dessert. Um, things like strawberries and Cool Whip. Cool Whip doesn't have any carbs. Some versions have one gram of carbs. But, I mean, that's a great sweet thing. It's kind of like strawberry shortcake without the shortcake. But, um, you know, sometimes it'll get you over if you're craving something sweet. Berries and Cool Whip helps. Vary your veggies to include green, red, and orange choices. Add fresh, frozen, or canned vegetables to salad, side dishes, and recipes. You know, sneak in vegetables wherever you can in your food. Usually if it's mixed with something else, you won't even notice that it's there, but you're getting the health benefit from it. Prepare your vegetables without sauces, gravies, or glazes to lower the amount of sodium, saturated fat, and added sugars. Frozen vegetables are quick and easy to use and are just as nutritious as fresh veggies. I love frozen vegetables. One thing, they're cheap. Two, they don't have added sodium. Um, three, you can help, you know, portion it out and you're not wasting. Sometimes if you use a canned vegetable, they all have extra sodium in them to help keep them from spoiling. And, you know, sodium's bad, raises um, blood pressure, um, leads to fluid retention. So get frozen vegetables, throw them in your freezer. You know, you can portion out what you want to eat and then you're not opening a can only eating half and throwing it out two days later. Also try adding frozen vegetables such as corn, peas, green peas, or spinach to your favorite dish. And look for frozen vegetables without added sauces, gravies, butter, or cream. Also canned vegetables can be a great addition to any meal, but just make sure that you look for reduced sodium, low sodium, or no salt added canned vegetables. Choose whole grain foods over the refined, refined grains. Make at least half of the amount of grains you eat each day whole grains. Find high fiber whole grain foods by reading nutrition labels or using those um, websites or apps that I mentioned. Some common whole grains include oatmeal, whole wheat flour, and popcorn. Experiment by substituting buckwheat, millet, or oat flour for up to half of white flour in your favorite pancake or waffle recipes. Um, and to limit saturated fat, top with fruit instead of butter and syrup. Choose low-fat or fat-free yogurt and drink fat-free or low-fat milk. You know, if you currently drink whole milk, you can gradually switch to lower versions. Um, and this change cuts saturated fat and calories, but it doesn't reduce calcium or other essential nutrients. Also buy low-fat or fat-free cheese more often than regular cheese. Top fruit salads and baked potatoes with low-fat yogurt instead of sour cream. When recipes such as dips call for sour cream, substitute plain yogurt. Use fat-free evaporated milk instead of cream and use low-fat or fat-free ricotta cheese as a substitute for cream cheese. Mix up your protein foods to include seafood, beans, nuts, seeds, soy, eggs, lean meats, and poultry. And select seafood at least twice a week, including fish and shellfish. 
Boy, there's more tips. Choose lean or low fat cuts of meat. One egg a day on average doesn't increase your risk for heart disease, so make eggs part of your weekly choices. Remember, only the yolk contains saturated fat, so have as many egg whites as you want. Add beans or cheese, unsalted nuts and seeds, and soy in main dishes and snacks. Choose turkey, chicken, canned tuna or salmon or peanut butter for sandwiches. Many deli meats such as bologna or salami are high in fat and sodium, so make them occasional treats only. You want to cut back on sugary beverages such as fruit drinks and soda. Get the flavor you crave, but in a smaller portion. So make or order a small turkey burger or a petite size steak or ask for a to-go container. And when your meal arrives, take half of your meal home. All right, so let's review quickly. So remember, to help control your diabetes and prevent other health problems, you want to remember balance and moderation. Eat regular meals, including breakfast. Eat at about the same time every day. Pay attention to your portion size and practice conscious eating. That's making smart food choices. Little bit about diet fads. So, you know, there's always a new diet around and I am weary of all of these. There have been many, intermittent fasting, HCG diet, grapefruit diet, cabbage soup diet, I mean, you name it. So you may lose weight, but a return to regular eating causes weight gain usually. And diet fads are not balancing nutrients due to food restrictions. So I do not recommend diet fads for anyone. However, what diets work for the long term? Not really diets. I like to call them lifestyle plans. So I am not endorsing any of these. I'm just kind of giving you a starting point for you to get more information on to see if, you know, sometimes it's easier to choose a lifestyle plan because they teach you how to eat more healthy and it's easier for some people to make changes that way. So that's why I want to mention them. So things like Weight Watchers, Nutrisystem, the Mediterranean diet, the DASH diet, and new things like Noom. Now I'm not going to go all through Weight Watchers. You know, it's been around since the 60s. Um, the thing I like about Weight Watchers is you do not have to buy special diet food. You know, there's no pills or doctor visits. It's actually a livable, sustainable program. You know, they have support groups. You can talk with people going through the same thing. Um, and, you know, it's more, it's more of not a weight loss. It is really a lifestyle plan. They teach you what foods are healthy and how to eat. So that's what I like about Weight Watchers. Of course, there is a cost involved. So that's something that you need to make the decision for yourself. Um, Nutrisystem is another one that also costs money, but Nutrisystem actually follows the food plate method, which is a recommended way of eating for people with diabetes. So, um, you know, this one, of course, the food gets delivered to you. So you do have to buy special foods, um, but it is easy to follow. And if you don't like to cook or, you know, it's easier for you to do it this way, Nutrisystem is a good one. And they do have a diabetic plan as well. So, you know, it also helps teach you kind of how to eat. The Mediterranean diet is actually the most recommended lifestyle diet by doctors. It marches actually National Nutrition Month. And once again, the Mediterranean diet has beat every other lifestyle diet by doctors and cardiologists. So Mediterranean diet is a heart healthy plan. I have a link in the resources to the Mediterranean diet for you to learn more about it. Um, interest in the Mediterranean diet began in the 1960s with the observation that coronary heart disease caused fewer deaths in the Mediterranean countries like Greece and Italy than in the US and Northern Europe. The Mediterranean diet blends the basics of healthy eating with the traditional flavors and cooking methods of the Mediterranean. So basically it's based on traditional cuisine of the countries bordering the Mediterranean Sea, thus the name Mediterranean diet, you know, there's no single definition of the Mediterranean diet, but typically it's high in vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, nuts and seeds, and guess what? Olive oil. So all the things that I've mentioned that are healthy. The main components of the Mediterranean diet includes daily consumption of vegetables, fruit, whole grains, and healthy fats, weekly intake of fish, poultry, beans, and eggs, moderate portions of dairy products, limited intake of red meat. Olive oil is the primary source of added fat. There's liberal use of herbs and spices and other important elements are sharing meals with family and friends, enjoying a glass of red wine and being physically active. 
There's also one that you might have heard of called the DASH diet. DASH stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. This is a lifelong approach to healthy eating. So if you find out that you have high blood pressure, you could start the DASH diet. It's a little restrictive, but it, it has been shown in studies to reduce blood pressure. So it actually was developed to lower blood pressure without medication in research sponsored by the National Institutes of Health. By following the DASH diet, remember lifelong following the DASH diet, um, people have been able to lower their blood pressure by eight to 14 points. It's in line with dietary recommend recommendations to prevent osteoporosis, cancer, heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. It's not a weight loss program, but most people tend to have weight loss with it because they're eating healthier on this. The DASH diet generally includes about 2000 calories a day. Um, it's a little complicated. I have a link for this diet on the resource page as well for you to read more about it. But basically it emphasizes vegetables, fruits, and low fat dairy foods and moderate amounts of whole grain, fish, poultry, and nuts. I guess you're catching a theme with healthy eating. It's pretty much the same things for every diet. Low fat dairy, whole grains, fish, poultry, and nuts. Um, so there's information on the DASH diet. Noom, I just want to mention because I think I see the commercial on TV like three times a day now. Um, what I like about it is it's also a lifestyle program that helps people lead healthier lives through behavior change because behavior change is what's going to help us in the long run. Our bad behaviors and habits is kind of what gets us into trouble. So turning those around is going to get us out of trouble. So Noom helps you create healthier habits, reduce risk of chronic health problems, reverse diseases, and foster healthier relationships. Of course, this is one that you also pay for. So that's for you to decide if you want to do it. But in 2017, Noom's program received full recognition by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to help with chronic diseases. So what about low-carb diets? Okay, you know, low-carb diet that's the rage every couple of years that it comes back to a low carb diet. They limit carbohydrates such as those found in grains, starchy vegetables and fruit and emphasize foods high in protein and fat. Many types of low carb diets exist. They each have varying restrictions on the types and amounts of carbohydrates you can eat. The low carb diet is generally used for losing weight and you will lose weight on a low carb diet. However, um, you gotta be careful with them. They do have some benefits. Um, many will help reduce risk factors associated with type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome. But I'll tell you the complications in a minute. So in general, low-carb diets focus on protein and some non-starchy vegetables. Excuse me. A low-carb diet generally excludes or limits most grains, legumes, fruit, bread, sweets, pasta, and starchy vegetables. And sometimes nuts and seeds are limited. They allow for small amounts of certain fruit, vegetables, and whole grains. So low-carb diets are like Atkins, South Beach, Keto, Paleo, and the low-carb, high-fat diet. You do want to check with your doctor before starting this um, to make sure that it's okay for you to do it. They might say it's okay for you to do it for a short amount of time to maybe lose some weight, but then you know, they'll want you to gradually bring, it, bring back in the foods that you are eliminating from a low-carb diet. However, if you suddenly and drastically cut carbs, there are some side effects. You might get a headache, bad breath, weakness, muscle cramps, fatigue, skin rash, and constipation or diarrhea. In addition, some diets restrict carbohydrate intake so much that in the long term, they can result in vitamin or mineral deficiencies, bone loss, and gastrointestinal disturbances, and may actually increase your risk of various chronic diseases. So that's why I say, talk with your doctor and you really want to research it before you start on a low carb diet. I also just briefly mentioned meal prep programs because there are a ton of these. I have a link to a story for you to read about them. Again, if you know cooking's not your thing or it's easier for you to have food prepared for you and sent to you, there are tons of programs out there that follow um, dietary restrictions. Um, just a few of them that I've seen are Blue Apron. They actually have, Medi they follow the Mediterranean diet. Um, Home Chef, Sun Basket, Freshly, Every Plate, Hello Fresh. All of these cost money, um, you know, depending on how many meals you get through them, but it might be an option for you. 
So did you pay attention? I was going to do this quiz, but as always, I talk and talk and talk and talk and I run out of time. So I'm not going to do the quiz. Y'all are off the hook because I need to talk a little bit about exercise. So being active. Chronic diseases can be prevented and treated with exercise. It is like the best thing you can do for any disease process you can think of. How much and what type of exercise should you get? You want to get at least 150 minutes of moderate level exercise per week. So moderate level means you can still talk when you're doing it. So you're not having to run a marathon or ride a bike like Lance Armstrong. You just want to get moving. Um, anything that gets your heart rate up is what you want to do. So don't be a couch potato. Get up and move at least 150 minutes a week. Exercise snacks add up. I wish I came up with that term, but I stole it from someone. I love exercise snacks. So, you know, you don't have to do 150 minutes all in one setting. If you're listening to a program or watching TV, you know, during the commercials or every five minutes, stand up, walk in place. Move your arms up and down, arm raises, leg lifts, whatever, for just a few minutes. All those minutes of activity add up. Snacks add up to a full meal. So do it with exercise too. And also don't forget about strengthening exercises. You don't have to go to a gym. You can use canned foods as weights. You could take a gallon milk jug and put water in it as a weight. I mean, whatever it is you have around the house, you can lift and strengthen your muscles that way. You can use your own body weight. Good old push-ups are strengthening exercises using your own body weight. So, you know, get creative. Like I said, moderate exercise is any movement that gets your heart pumping, but you're still able to talk. So things like brisk walking, dancing, water aerobics, gardening, even vacuuming. So even your chores can count as activity. Like I said, get creative. Um, you know, the PT brands, which are the bands, which are those big rubber band kind of things, those help strengthen your muscles. Um, Push-ups, squats, lunges, yoga, planks, any kind of thing that you use your own body weight helps build muscle. Here's my tips for increasing activity. Again, don't get overwhelmed with adding exercise into your life. Choose one activity, put it into practice until it becomes a habit, and then repeat steps two and three to continue to add activities to your lifestyle. Remember, exercise snacks add up. Just get to moving every hour, stand up and do something just to get your circulation moving. It helps you um, burn calories, helps keep your blood sugar blood sugar normalized, you know, add exercise to your calendar. If you're the type that likes to schedule everything, add exercise to your schedule and stick to it. Sometimes getting an exercise buddy helps keep you accountable or helps you remember to exercise. So that's always a good thing to do if you can. And remember that no one is perfect. Any activity that you do more than you have been is a good thing. I do have a list of accessible exercise resources um, on the resource page. I have a bunch of audio described yoga. Yoga is a great exercise. There's also some cardiovascular, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Some sessions, cardiovascular sessions from blindalive.com. And I have the links on the resource page. There are some stretching audio described exercises. And then there are a few um, webinars with blind people that they talk about exercising with blindness. Also have Tai Chi with audio description and Eyes Free Fitness is another resource link. And then there's blind audio described Qigong and Tai Chi. Martial arts is also a very good activity to participate in. So I know I'm running near the end of time as I always do because I talk so much, but that's the end of what I was gonna say. And I guess I'll stop now and see if there are any questions. So if you have any questions, you can put them in chat. And if you don't have any questions, I will just assume that I covered everything perfectly and you all are experts now. And like I said, you can always watch the webinar later. I know there's a lot of information. Um, and I think Elias said it might be a couple of weeks before it's posted to the Vision Aware site, but it will have um, 
all the tips that I talked about, you know, so you can pick a healthy goal to start making positive changes in your life. The resources for the audio described exercise um, videos are, will be there. And I think that's all. That's all we mentioned. Yes. And then you can watch the webinar again. Yeah, I'm looking to see, this is a lie. I'm looking to see if there's any questions in the chat. If you have questions, um, please put them in the chat. Um, we won't be able to unmute anyone. So it'll be best to do that. Okay. Looks like Rosie uh, had a comment. Um, thank you so much. Great information. We'll definitely share with VR diabetic customers. Thank you. Yeah, I think the resource page is something great to share with your VR customers as well. Yes. Um, so they can, you know, a lot of people think they can't exercise at home. They have to go to a gym and all this stuff, but there's lots you can do at home and it's safe, you know, because you know your home surrounding better than you know um, other things. Mm -hmm. So what about precautions to exercise? I saw come up always, you know, you, you do want to have a conversation with your doctor before you, you know, start a hardcore or moderate core exercise program. But honestly, activity is what you need. So, you know, when I'm talking about exercise, I'm not really talking about, you know, going to a gym and training for a marathon or something like that. I'm talking about just getting activity. Your body needs to move. Um, you know, if you have excess pressure in your eyes, you probably don't want to lift anything real heavy. So you would do more kind of a moderate cardiovascular exercise like walking or moving your arms up and down or leg lifts, but you probably don't wanna do strength training before talking to your doctor because lifting too much can increase the pressure. So if you have something like that going on, definitely. But you know, just the point that I'm trying to get across is I don't want you to be a couch potato or think that you can't do anything because you can't see or you have chronic diseases. You wanna move around as much as possible. And I believe there's also a web page on Vision Aware that kind of talks about precautions with exercise that we are updating. So that will also have some tips in there for you. I think, let's see what it says. Walking, I'm sorry, Eli, I think oh, I jumped okay. on it. Walking in place, if apl applicable, is great for those that can't go out and about. Definitely. I mean, it sounds kind of silly and you might feel silly just kind of marching in place in your own home, but it's activity and your body's going to love you for it. Put some music on and dance. That's what I say. Looks like Pris has her hand up. Pris? Okay. No, I really don't. I didn't mean to. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Well, I really appreciate y'all's participation and I hope you got some good tips out of this webinar and I know we're kind of out of time. So Alaya, I think you wanna give them the closing code. Thank you for the compliments, I appreciate it. Yes, um, give me one second here. Okay. Okay, well, thank you so much, Kim, for all that great information. I know I learned a lot more today than I've known in a while about this stuff. So um, always a pleasure um, having you on and doing these webinars. Um, I know everybody appreciates it. So um, I guess everyone will see you at the next webinar um, and go to the APH um, Connect Center dot com website and um you can find the archive webinar there and information about the um documents that kim wanted to share with you you can also access in there okay everybody have a good night thank you so much thank you kim thank you bye 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 thanks kim